now I'm gonna, we're going to have uh, a talk from Laura Welcher. Um, she's a PhD linguist who came to us originally uh, with the Rosetta Project. And uh, Jim O'Neill pointed out at, at lunch that really language um, in and of itself is kind of a, a, a long-term institution. Uh, and it is one of the things that allows culture to persist even across, um, in some cases, genocides and wars and huge transitions. And uh, Laura not only um, has worked uh, in dying languages, but also has been working with us as the head of our library projects in how to make uh, language and meaning persist over thousands of years. So, Dr. Laura Welcher. So I'm keenly aware that I'm occupying the, uh, the nap slot. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I decided not to do slides and instead to do kind of an old school show and tell, uh, which I think is an appropriate way to present something about language. I'm gonna use just language to communicate something to you and if I were really hardcore about it, I wouldn't even have notes. But some of my thinking around the things that I'm gonna talk about is, is really very new. Uh, and so there's a chance that I could forget everything I wanted to say. Um, and what I want to say is, um, is related to a white paper that I'm working on uh, for an edited volume about um, the future of linguistic data, especially archived linguistic data. Um, kind of drawing from my experience with, with working on the documentation of human languages and language archives. Uh, but I'm talking to an academic crowd and I'm the one who can actually talk about, I have permission because I work for the Long Now Foundation to talk about the very long view. So my thinking about that is this is coming from the perspective of uh, sort of language archives around the world that are helping to support the work of linguists who are doing language documentation in the communities that are relying on them to try to bring their, their languages back. So it's, it's all pretty new. Uh, but to, f to give you some context, um, I worked at the Long Now Foundation here for about 15 years now. And um, I came here originally as an academic linguist to work on the Rosetta Project. And I've since kind of expanded to work on other language projects we here, have here at Long Now. Uh, on our library projects more broadly. So I think of a lot of the work that we do here outside of the clock as having to do with the Long Now Library. Uh, and this is like one instantiation of the library that you see up here. We call this the Manual for Civilization. Uh, it's currently in, in development. Um, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a physical book collection, but the idea is you know, whatever information might be useful to, to help support and sustain civilization over the very long term. Um, I uh, helped develop uh, in both content and in form the original Rosetta disk. And you can see uh, the first one that we created there in the, the curio cabinet behind you. It's in a sphere. I thought it would pass one around. Uh, this version is the version that's in the, um, in the Smithsonian. And I'll pass it around with, you actually need a microscope to read it, so you won't be able, be able to read it uh, with this magnifying glass, but you can, you can get a, a, a bit of a closer look at it. Um, now, the, the project, uh, if you haven't heard about it before, is, is both a project in uh, collecting information on human languages and language documentation, as well as an experiment in very long-term archiving on the scale of thousands of years. And um, Xander, if I could start you off kind of passing that around with the microscope. Uh, there's also a wearable version, by the way, if you want to take a closer look. I have one with me. Um, so the, the Rosetta project in the disk was originally inspired by this Rosetta stone artifact. This isn't the actual artifact. The actual artifact <laughs> is in the British Museum. This is the portable version. I call this the eye stone. <laughs> it's in the British Museum. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's about this tall, and it's got uh, incredibly, it, it almost has microscopic writing on it, in fact. Um, and uh, so this, this artifact, which was discovered in Egypt by Nato Napoleon soldiers, and eventually made its way into the hands of somebody, Champollion, who was able to actually decipher it, uh, was key to um, deciphering the, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic script. And the, the way that worked is there's, this is the same text, a decree written three different times. And on the bottom here, you have ancient Greek, 
Uh, in the middle here, you have uh, kind of a script, a later script form of Egyptian called demotic, and then at the top you have the Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs. And at the time, um, people thought it, it probably represented human language, but they had no, no key for it. And it was the Rosetta Stone, because of its parallel structure, that enabled people to kind of work their way back and figure out that, that this was actually uh, representing a spoken language. And it turns out that there were lots and lots of other texts that were then um, able to be uh, transcribed and translated um, once you have this kind of this kind of key, so I'll pass that one around as well. I'll share my eye stone with you. Um, so, so using that as our model, uh, we also collected parallel information that is the same information for as many languages of the world as we could. Um, now there are about seven thousand languages spoken in the world today, and those have many dialects within them. So there's a lot of of linguistic diversity. It's not, of course, as broad or as deep as the world's biological diversity, but um, it's still considerable. Um, we got documentation for as many languages as we could, but not all of the languages of the world are very well described. So a lot of languages don't have any documentation, and, and uh, we needed to try to collect some, and that's part of the work of what our Panlex project is doing in vocabulary. But there's over a thousand languages represented on the disk in some form or another. And on the one that I'm, that's being passed around, there's uh, about 13,000 microscopic pages of documentation that you can read at optical magnification, that's with a microscope, uh, at about 1,000 times power. So it's intended to be the, it's it, like an intentional Rosetta, Star, Rosetta Stone artifact for the future. Um, and we think about it kind of like a secret decoder ring to whatever information we lay, may leave to the future in the form of our human languages. Um, and as far as the content on it goes, the, um, it's great content to represent humanity because it's a picture of our linguistic and cultural diversity um, at the beginning of the 21st century. And this picture um, is going to change pretty drastically probably over the next few hundred years. Uh, because we're, we're projecting that we're probably going to lose maybe as much as 35 to 40 percent of the world's linguistic diversity over the next few centuries. Um, the current rate is about six languages per year, so the question is whether or not that's going to speed up or slow down. But this is what we're, we're seeing, and so you can kind of see what the writing on the wall is. Um, and most of the languages of the world, of course, don't have, you know, a billion speakers or millions of speakers, they have more like 10,000 speakers. And for most of human history, that was just a normal-sized human language. It could be very viable. Even smaller languages like the ones that I've worked on could be very viable. But in sort of the modern era, uh, where we're very globally connected, there are languages with great global economic power. Uh, it's really hard for these smaller languages to make a go of it. And so what we're seeing is that people are shifting away from these languages to more dominant ones, uh, and they're leaving their heritage languages behind. Um, there's various reasons for doing this throughout history. Um, some of the things that we've seen here in the United States have been outright oppression, forced assimilation, boarding schools, relocations, you know, even genocide. So this has happened in places around the world. It's happening today. Um, so to step outside of Long Now and the Rosetta Project, um, you know, I, I started out my work as an academic linguist and had been working as a graduate student researcher um, to document and describe some of the most uh, critically endangered languages in native North America, um, particularly around the Midwest where I grew up. And they have very few speakers and most of them are elderly, and when I started my work on a particular language, there, was, there were 50 speakers left. Uh, and I worked with uh, many people who are no, no longer here. Um, and I fully expected when I was doing this documentation work uh, that the language was going to go extinct in my lifetime. Um, and we're now to the point, you know, I've kept one foot in this work, and we're now to the point that there's about five speakers of this language left, maybe, maybe that. Um, but the work that we have done on language documentation with the last speakers, including creating dictionaries, there's a dissertation that's been written that's a grammar. We've done uh, NSF-funded projects to document uh, stories um, 
and record those on video and transcribe them. Um, this is the work that uh, is going to be very helpful to the next generation. I've also worked with the next generation on trying to bring this language back into modern and, and vital use again um, and teaching the language to an even younger generation of children. So that's the first thing that happens when languages become endangered and threatened. You see that the children are no longer speaking it. And of course, as that generation ages, that's when the language is going to, to go extinct. So every language is just kind of one generation away from extinction, actually. It's about a, a, a process of perpetuating it across generations that keeps these, uh, this alive. So um, this is happening really all over the world today. You know, half of the languages of the world are endangered in some form or another. Um, and at Long Now, we talk about um, the possibility of future societal collapse or civilizational collapse. And we look to examples in the past, Jared Diamond's um, examples of civilizational collapse. And it's also, of course, one of the purposes of the Manual for Civilization when, the, when this project is fully realized. But the way I look at it, each endangered language is a case study in civilizational collapse. Um, you know, we ask ourselves, could it happen? But it's actually happening all around us. It's happening right now. Um, as these languages and cultures, the languages and the cultures they helped build disappear. Um, and many language communities around the world are going back to archived language data. These are called sometimes language rec reclamation projects or revitalization projects um, to try to bring their languages back into modern use again. And that's, that's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to do. And there's a lot of questions around, you know, when you bring a language back from the brink, is it still like the same language? Um, you know, all languages change over time. Languages that come back from the brink like that probably perhaps change even more. They may go through a process of creolization, we don't know. But they're still, I, I recently um, had a, a really interesting take on this from um, a man who's Miamia, uh, and he worked with his family to bring his language back um, into, in, into use in his community and into use in his family. Um, and. His reasons for doing it, I think, are really interesting. It's because he wanted to reconnect with his... It wasn't because he wanted to bring the language back for the language's sake. He wanted to bring it back so that the knowledge that his ancestors had could live again. He felt like there was a very important need for that knowledge to exist in the modern world, and he wanted to, to make that happen through his language. Um, and... So the people who are working on these revitalization projects around the world, some of which I'm involved with, some of which are happening even here in the Bay Area, um, these are efforts at civilizational maintenance. Um, they are critically dependent on archived materials, uh, the kind of documentation that I worked on. Um, I thought I'd pass around this example of language documentation. This is a, an old publication um, of, it's called Yana Texts. This is a, uh, a work that was compiled by the linguist Edward Sapir. And it's it is an example of one kind of language documentation. It's a collection of texts that are translated and annotated and, and analyzed. Um, and you could do a lot with a book like this. And when Edward Sapir met Ishii. I don't know how many of you know the story of Ishii, but you know, the last speaker of the Yahi language, the reason he could communicate with him at all is because he knew Yana. He knew some Yana. And Yana is an extinct language today. Um, but the only reason we have, you know, Ishii, we have a few recordings of stories he told, and I worked on some of these as a graduate student. And the only way that we have any understanding of what he's saying is because of the, the archive documentation work on Yana. So this is one example of that. Well, pass it around. So back to the, the Rosetta project. Um, so I want to tie these ideas together about, um, about endangered languages, language maintenance, um, the relationship of those communities to archival records. Uh, because in the Rosetta project, the other side, of course, is that we're trying to do this very long-term archiving. 
Um, and, but when I came to the Rosetta Project, I thought that my role was going to be, I was going to help save these languages. I was going to help bring them back. And the, you know, the Rosetta Project was going to be the thing that was going to do that. Um, but the Rosetta Disk and the Rosetta Project is not going to save any language. Um, there, certainly, there's not enough information on any language on the Rosetta Disk to save it. And if you really wanted to document a language, I mean, look at all of the information we have on the English language. That's probably one of the better documented languages we have. And most of the languages of the world have nothing like that. Um, so you could have some uh, basic elements of documentation, like a set of texts, a dictionary, and a grammar that would be very valuable things to have. But none of these is going to actually save a language, because a language needs to be lived. Uh, not archived. What the Rosetta Project and the Rosetta Disk can do is we can help create a better environment that sees language diversity as a benefit to humanity rather than as a threat, uh, which is the way most people see languages and one of the pressures that work against their maintenance over time. So the Rosetta Project, I decided, and the Rosetta Disk isn't about saving languages, uh, but it is about creating a better context and environment for them. Um, so. I wisened up and then I realized that the big problem that the Rosetta Project was trying to solve is actually one of um, methods and materials of, for long-term archiving. So we just need to figure out the right way to store information so that we can last, it, the information can last a long time. Uh, so you know, we're gonna write all this information, we're gonna put it onto a nickel disk and we can read it with a microscope. So even if, though we don't have very broad uh, uh, and deep information on any language, it's going to be the kind of information that's going to last a thousand years from now. We've got everybody beat um, <laughs> in this department. So it turns out that you can actually scratch the disk and obliterate hundreds of languages, probably with just running your, your, your nail over it. And I'm, I'm working on that problem. But, um, but maybe it's better to store information in some kind of forever hard drive, right? Or maybe by nano-manipulating quartz structures like um, there's a, a a, a researcher by the name of Peter Kazansky that's looking at that as a new way of storing information. Uh, or maybe we should store data in DNA. I mean, that's got you know, incredible capacity. Um, so there's, there's projects that are emerging all the time to try to explore new store everything forever uh, technologies. Um, but then I realized all of these, all of these other efforts have a problem. So I wisened up and I realized it's actually, an we have an encoding problem. Um, so all of these projects that are working on very long-term archiving are now coming to Long Now and asking for our curated language data to put in their store everything forever media, whether it's DNA or whether it's in this quartz structure or what have you. Um, and it's going to be buried, or it's going to be stored in a salt mine, or maybe it's going to be blasted into space, or what have you. And I don't mean to make light of these projects. We're, I actually think these projects are really cool and important, and we're partnering with a lot of them. But um, I realized that all of these efforts, including the Rosetta Project, has a pretty serious encoding problem. So I'll use an example of DNA. So let's say you wanted to um, encode a human story, like let's say Jack and the Beanstalk. We want to tell a story in English of Jack and the Beanstalk and we want to encode it in DNA. Uh, you know, one way you could do that is you could just take the waveform and trans transform that into ones and zeros and put that onto the disk. Um, we did work um, uh, to get some data, data in DNA. Uh, and the way it was done is it, the, the spoken language, the words, were turned into writing. So, the first layer of encoding there, though, is language. And people forget that human language is an encoding of human experience in a particular en environment on planet Earth, right? So language is the first encoding. If you write language, if you create a writing system for it, then that's another layer of encoding. You've now encoded spoken language, so there's two layers in. If you take the writing and then turn that into binary ones and zeros, that's a third layer. And that, I want to say, is not a simple thing to do. So I don't know if, how many of you have heard of the Unicode standard, but the Unicode standard is a way to uniquely represent any character in any language on Earth uh, with a unique encoding in a, a digital form. This is the fifth edition. They're now on like the 11th edition. And it's even thicker than this, right? So that's not a simple encoding. So OK, so now we're in digital. 
and you want to go from digital to DNA, right? So you're going to have to translate your ones and zeros into the nucleotides of DNA. So now we're into what? Three, four layers of encoding. And you want your DNA to be this long-term forever archive. Um, so first of all, somebody's going to have, you know, 1,000 years from now or more, somebody's going to have to discover this. And they're going to have to know that there's actually information there. So they're gonna, and then they're going to have to figure out how they're going to get at that data. And once they do, they have to read it. They have to know to convert it back into ones and zeros and go from the ones and zeros back to a writing system and then go from the writing back to the spoken language. And when they get there, then they have some kind of spoken text or some, some bit of language, right? What the heck does it mean, right? How do they know a thousand years in the future, two thousand years, what, what, was, what was actually said and meant by Jack and the Beanstalk? Um, so the real, the real problem, I think, um, that is at the base of all of these questions is how do we preserve meaning? Um, so to go back to our example of the, the Rosetta Stone, if we had an intentional message left to us by some ancient Egyptian that we needed to decode, um, how could we really understand what that meant? Um, you know, we have the Rosetta Stone, we have lots of texts of ancient Egyptians, so we have a big corpus to use. Uh, we understand the grammatical structure. We could probably come up with something that's a reasonable approximation, but could we be really sure? I think without a native speaker, you really can't. You would just, there would be some probability there, but it's not a sure thing. So meaning is actually created by all of the connections between things that humans make and encode in their languages and in, the, in their cultures, and it's highly complex. And for a language to have meaning, I postulate that it must be lived. Uh, but as we've seen, language is precarious. Lived language is precarious. The knowledge that we pass on from generation to generation through them is ephemeral, and it's easily lost. So we should make an archival backup, right? Uh, and there's lots of challenges, as we've shown, with this as well, right? The Rosetta Project is helping figure out how to do this, and we're getting better at it. Uh, but it's still a bit of a challenge. So the best answer I have for this problem, I think so far, the problem of how we preserve meaning, is that we need both. Uh, we need to write things down, and we need to put them in our archives. But over time, like those texts of Yana, uh, they become discontinuous from any lived event. Um, and left alone, they become disembodied. Uh, and over long periods of time, they become disencultured they lose meaning. Lived, lived experience is what provides the meaning. Archives store information, lived experience stores knowledge. Both are precarious, but in a healthy society, they should be in continual dialogue with each other and each providing critical support for the other. Thank you.